Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and hopefully we'll be done with this soon and we'll have Liberty Larry back. Um, we are looking at some other options to get him involved still, but uh, to tell you the truth, I hadn't even talked to Liberty Larry in a week, which is really unusual. But um, here we are, and I, uh, I I'm, it should be kind of a short podcast. I, I, I really want to take a shower. Um, I haven't, uh, let's see. So I got up this morning, I worked out. Um, went and took care of some errands and it's, it's time for a shower, but I figure if I get too far into my day before I do this recording, I won't. So it's been a bit and I wanted to get some content out to you guys. It's a little difficult still because, uh, I, I'm, I still got a moratorium on watching the news. Um, I, I tried to listen to some news earlier in the week and, um, then it just made me fear for my life as usual. So I, uh, I was a bit of a germ freak before all this. And then I end up compulsively checking my temperature and it's just not healthy. So I'm still staying away from it. Um, I do have, uh, hopefully we're kind of done with this, uh, talking about the virus anyway. Um, but I do have a few more things to say, and again, the, the focus is, is still the same as government overreach. Um, the, uh, you know, the idea of the cure being worse than the disease, this is, I mean, I, this is what I'm talking about when I say that. I don't know what Trump means necessarily. I, I think he's just talking about an economic collapse. Um, too late for that, right? Again, I, you know... I don't understand how we identify essential businesses. I, I will say once again that I think all businesses are essential to somebody. Um, I really need a haircut. I really need a haircut. I can't go get one. So, by the way, Jill, if you're listening, um, then uh, maybe we can arrange something. Uh, I will go somewhere else. Whatever. Anyway, Um this is this is going to damage a lot of people. I got a a, a friend who runs a, um, a game shop, like board games and hobbies and things like that. Um, they are a non-essential business. Now, when we're all trapped at home, what could be more essential than that business? So now you're trapped at home and you got nothing to do and you can't go out and buy something to do because that's a non-essential business. Oh, well. Sorry for him, too. Um, but here we are. And uh, and I'm sure uh, many of you have seen the at least the memes out there. There's the um, paddleboard guy out in, in California who got arrested for uh, defying the stay-at-home order like by being out on the water by himself, hundreds of yards from anyone. And then they go and, and arrest him. And uh, and what are they going to do with him then? So he gets thrown in a cage with a bunch of other people in close proximity. Let's think about what we're trying to prevent here and use a little common sense. The whole idea that justice is blind is, is absurd. Um, you know, justice is subjective. That's, that's what makes it justice. Um, and you got to consider what you're trying to, um, to address, uh, when you think about how to punish something, you know, something that, um, maybe somebody did that was breaking the letter of the law. Then you have, uh, you know, the, this Florida pastor, um, who, um, was arrested for holding serv church services with hundreds of people there. Uh, now I'm not on board with this, uh, you know, with this, um, um, Jesus shield thing, uh, you know, um, I, I could swear there was something about God helping those that help themselves. You, you know, if you put yourself in danger, you know, just because you have strong faith doesn't keep you safe. I mean, this is the same idea that the snake handlers, uh, uh you know, subscribe to, right? Like, 
I think most of us can agree that that's a little nutty. But um, on the other hand, um, this Hillsborough County Sheriff, Chad Cronister, I'm, I'm going to call him out actually, um, arrested this Florida pastor for holding church services, uh, defying the, the stay-at-home order or the limit on assembly. Now, the problem with this here is that the, the sheriff's job, like the sheriff is the only constitutional law enforcement officer. The sheriff's job is to enforce the Constitution. And right there in the First Amendment of the Constitution is that people are, uh, there will be no restrictions on peaceable assembly. Um, I think church qualifies. So regardless of what the government has said, um, the, the churches have every right to meet if they choose. Nobody's making them. That's... You know, that's where this all comes in. The president, this is, a, I think, a misunderstanding at this point. Um, the president is not the boss of the country. Uh, and you, frankly, local government isn't your boss either. Um, there was a time when the U.S. was populated by adventurous, resourceful. In fact, I say there was a time. The U.S. was originally populated by a, a bunch of adventurous, resourceful, self-reliant people. Um, that were comfortable making their own risk assessments, that, you know, abandoned a life halfway around the world um, to come here into the unknown. I mean, this is this is where our country came from. Um, and I, I'm not sure when we became a bunch of, like, obsequious sycophants. I, I, when did we go from rejecting even the concept of a king to pleading for one? Now, I have no problems with people choosing to... I have no problems with the government recommending um, that you stay home. The This sheriff, Chad Cronister, said that the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Department will continue um, to focus on the three E's. Encourage, educate, and enforce. I think maybe we should have stopped after two. Encourage and educate and allow people to make their own decisions, their own risk assessments, to decide for themselves what they're willing to risk and what's important to them. Um, if you throw the third E in there, that enforce, then the first two don't really matter that much, do they? I don't have any problem with you deciding to isolate yourself, to stay at home. What I have a problem with is that you then use the coercive power of government to make sure that I make the same decision that you made. That's where we have a problem. So... Anyway, I, I suppose that I'm done with that. Just keep that in mind. Um, people are be, people are capable of making their own decisions, and whether government's there or not, um, it, when people see a high enough risk of going out, they'll stop. When people see a high enough risk of meeting, they'll stop. Um, the you know this pastor didn't coerce anybody to go to church. They chose to go to church. The people that felt that it was dangerous didn't. And so be it. So, moving on to something else. Since I, I don't really have news to talk about, and um, I, I figure that we'll talk about some economics using uh, maybe some things that other people are settling into. Um, I don't know what the rest of you guys have been doing. I have have been playing computer games a lot more. Of course, there's... Uh, movies and TV shows and what have you too. We were surrounded by entertainment. And that's maybe a good starting point here. Uh, I was watching a stream um, the other night before I went to bed. And uh, they got to talking about the prices of video games um, and how obscene they've become and how it's not fair and, and so forth. I, that's only a part of it. I mean, the actual streamer was like saying that he believed that people can charge whatever they want for their video games, um, and it's up for the consumer to decide whether that's worth it to them. Exactly right. That's exactly right. But um, there were, I don't know, there were some interesting things that came up in this and, and some things that I wanted to address. So uh, for anybody who has been playing games, you've watched the prices rise. Um, but with the number of uh, digital distribution outlets and the competition between them, um, you also see a lot of sales. And so I think that the 
we can probably establish that the the appropriate price for a video game is somewhere between the least amount that the producer is willing to um, charge for it and the most amount the consumer is willing to pay for it. It's going to be between those two numbers. And it'll settle. And it'll change. Um, one of the things that they were talking about, though, uh, is uh, regional differences in prices. So um, the Canadian dollar isn't worth the same as the U.S. dollar. The Australian dollar isn't worth the same as the U.S. dollar. And so there was this idea that if you were charging 60 U.S. dollars for a video game, um, that the, the price in Australia should be uh, whatever the exchange rate is times that $60. So the uh, uh, equivalent value um, in Australian dollars, which I don't know what that would be right now, and I'm not going to look it up. But uh, I, I, so I disagree. And one of the, the streamer told a story. I, I didn't check the um, accuracy of this, but I found it interesting. Um, he was talking about the, uh, the Nine Inch Nails um, album, uh, Year Zero, uh, which came out in like 2007. This is a while back. He said uh, at the time, um, the, the charge was significantly higher in real dollars and, you know, adjusted to U.S. dollars in Australia than it was in the U.S. And um, that Trent Reznor asked why the price was so much higher in Australia. And the answer that he got is because people were willing to pay that. And he had a problem with that. Now, I don't. That's exactly what the price should be, right? If people are willing to pay it, then you charge it. If you charge too much, then people stop paying for it. And there ended up, like... Um, in the game industry, apparently this problem was the same. Um, but at some point the distributors in Australia, uh, you know, banded together, I suppose, and said, um, yeah, if you're going to charge us this much, the, you know, this premium here, um, we're not going to, uh, buy from you anymore. We'll buy from other people. There are other entertainment options and it fixed and that's how a market should work, right? And then apparently there was a, like I said, I didn't check the accuracy of this, so who knows. Um, but uh, apparently, or what I was told, I guess, is that uh, Trent Reznor, actually there's some video out there of him saying that it was, you know, absurd that uh, Australians should have to pay more for this album um, in adjusted dollars and uh, that they should just go out and steal it. No, that's, that's absurd. Um, like, first off, you know, we do have an issue with theft. But secondly, um, it, it's there's a real lack of understanding, I think, in how all this stuff happens and where this money goes. Um, it, there's just a general misunderstanding of capitalism, and I'm hoping I can use this to try and explain some of it. So... The money, the profit that's made off of the Nine Inch Nails album uh, doesn't just go towards the people that worked with Nine Inch Nails and Nine Inch Nails themselves. Right? It, it's, not, it's not just about supporting that album. And when you make a video game, it's not just about supporting that video game. You don't produce a video game and then sell it in order to make the money that you spent on it and a little bit more so that everybody can distribute that profit and be happy with it. Um, if they follow Trent Reznor's advice and just stole the album instead of purchasing it, then there's less money for the, the company to use to discover new talent, to promote other artists, to promote smaller artists, to create their albums. Um, if people follow Trent Reznor's advice and just stole the album instead of purchasing it, then there's some other guy, some little musician, um, that didn't get his shot because of that, that might have otherwise. Um, that somebody that nobody knew that may have been promoted by the company, um, and may have been the next big thing, and they didn't get their chance. There's a bunch of try and failure. Uh, if you're, and it's the same thing with video games, right? So, if 
a company produces a game and they profit significantly off of it, they use that profit to invest in new development. And this is the thing about business anyway. Um, the successful business is the one that, that correctly predicts the future needs or desires um, of, the, uh, of the consumer. If you're producing what's popular right now, if this is what you do with your business, if you see what everybody else is doing and say, I can do that, you're already behind. You're, you're going to lose in the long run. You may survive that way. I mean, there's certainly, you know, games and music that follows a formula that's tried and true. But in the long run, they're just not going to make it um, on their own. Of course, uh, you know, these businesses generally support a wide array of options. But the, the point is that in, uh, you know, if you have a business and you're trying to um, feed the customer what it is that they want right now, then you're not going to make it that long. The way you really grow a business is by successfully predicting what you can get other people to buy in the future that's different than what you have now. Um, and that's what these profits do, is that they allow you to experiment. Because there's, there's uh, you know, it's there's some failure in that too. And the successful businesses are right more than they're wrong. Um, so they lose money on a few uh, enterprises and they make money on a few enterprises. And if you have more wins than losses, that's how you go. I mean, it, it works that way if you're in the stock market too, by the way. Um, but this is just generally true of how a market works. And so the, the other alternative here is I, I guess people think that um, if you're making a new video game that because we have this debt-based society now, and certainly this happens too, but that a company will borrow a bunch of money so that they can produce this game. And then they put out this game, and the goal is to make enough money to pay off their debts and to pay all their people. And then they do that again. But that's not a, that's not a winning strategy long term. Um, what you need to be able to do is to use the profits from the game to pay off your people, um, any debts that you may have had, and to start the development of the next game at the very least, if not fully fund the development of the next game. The capital investment is a much better strategy than going into debt every time, because a couple of failures in a row, if you're going into debt every time, you don't have that option anymore, and you just fold up. But if you've managed to make a profit and, and save some money and invest that capital into future development, then you may lose a couple, um, but you have, a, a, you have more chances to make it work. And that is exactly what capitalism is. It, that's the, the core concept, is that capital investment is what grows an economy. Um, that... Uh, you generate something that people want, that people are willing to give you something of value for. Um, you do that, and you get to put some of that money away to develop the next thing that people want and that they're willing to give you something of value for. Hopefully that was clear. And there's difference in value anyway. Um... That's one of those things when we go back to the regional differences and why you know, people were willing to pay more in Australia, and that's okay. You know, um, As a general rule, people don't give up more than they're willing to. The, the, um, especially when you're talking about entertainment things. Like if you keep putting prices up, pushing prices up, pushing prices up, there's a bunch of other options. Like I said before, there's movies and TV shows. There's books. Um, there's the cheap little uh, mobile games that are cost you almost nothing. Um, there's a big complaint in the game industry about microtransactions. So what? I guess it sucks people in. That's really the the idea um, that they 
if they only spend a couple of dollars at a time, but they do it over and over and over again, it costs them, you know, more than they realize. So what? People have to make their own decisions about that. Um, they know what they're getting, and what they've decided is that whatever they're getting is worth more than the dollars that they had in their pocket. And what the company on the other side has decided is that the dollars in their pocket are worth more to them than the product that they're giving out. Unequal value is what makes the market work. Um, or unequal value assessments, I guess is what I should say. Um, the difference in what people think, you know. I, I traded a, a while back. Um, I'm lucky enough to be able to edit these podcasts um, and I do very little editing, by the way, if you're curious. I pretty much just like even out the sound and take out any um, ambient noise and, and I post it up. I have these things posted about 20 minutes after um, I finish recording. And half that time is spent taking down the equipment. But uh, I'm lucky enough to do the editing on a good professional audio software. And... Um, I got the license to that software by trading a license to another software suite. So I traded a license to, to one software suite to a friend um, for a license to the software suite that includes this audio software that I use. And the, um, the license that I traded is a subscription um, that I pay about 100 bucks a year for. And the license that I received that included this audio software is a one-time license fee, but it's about three grand. So if he gets to continue to use my license for 30 years, then we'll have an even trade um, in terms of, of actual dollar value. But, you know, we made this trade a couple of years ago. I, I doubt that we'll ever, you know, actually have an even dollar value trade, but when I pointed that out, I was like, look, what I'm giving you is worth, you know, maybe a few hundred dollars over a few years. What you're giving me is worth a few thousand dollars right now. Um, so you're definitely getting the worst end of the deal. And his response was, hey, no, look, I have a license that you need. You have a license that I need. We both get what we want out of this. Okay, fair enough. Uh, okay, um, shifting a little bit, as long as we're talking about prices, um, let's, uh, let's imagine a new scenario. Um, let's say that you start a new business. Um, <laughs> I, I just finished watching uh, Dead Like Me, so we'll say your new business is a kitchen organization consultant. Um, that you help people organize their kitchens so that they can find everything that they want. That's what you do. And um, you charge a hundred bucks an hour. And maybe over a, a period of a, a few weeks or a few months after you start the business, if you're lucky, um, you're now getting uh, so many requests that you don't have time to, to respond to all of them. Or that you've pushed um, your schedule book out months uh, because you've filled in so many things. Um, you got more work than you can handle. Well, what do you do? If this is a, a personal skill, um, you know, maybe you can't bring in somebody else to help you to take up some of the, some of the uh, work. Uh, so what do you do to even this out? The answer is you raise your price. 100 bucks an hour obviously wasn't enough because more people want it than you can, uh, than you can service. So... Maybe you bump it up to 125 Well, now it's not worth uh, $125 an hour to some people, and maybe they, they cancel or you get fewer people scheduling. And you just keep bumping up the price until you reach a point where the amount of work you get is the amount of work that you can, that you can finish. Now, um, if that price climbs up high enough and word gets out, somebody else with the same set of skills might enter this market say, wow, I can make $250 an hour um, just helping people organize their kitchens. I'm good at this too. Uh, my regular job um, only makes me 30 bucks an hour. So, 
you know, it's, it's time for a new, uh, a new career, right? And maybe you have several people enter the market. Well, now, um, if you're charging $250 an hour and there's a couple other people that have now entered the market, uh, well, how do they pull their market share away from you? Well, one of the ways they can do it is charge less. So then it puts downward pressure on the prices. Um, and so at, at some point, though, uh, you started at $100 an hour. Um, maybe enough people have entered the market that, uh, that it pushes the price down um, to about that level. Well, if it drops below that, do you stay in? How many people stay in? Maybe it's still more money than you were making before, so you're okay with it. Maybe you're just so much better at it that you can still charge a little bit of a premium and get enough people um, that want your service. But at some point, there's, it's going to reach a level as the downward pressure on prices because people entered the market because they could make so much money. Um, at some point, uh, the price drops low enough that people start leaving the market. They're like, oh, well, I mean, this sounded like a great idea when I could make $150 an hour. Um, making $75 an hour, it's not as interesting to me. And so they leave the market. And now you got uh, you know, people competing. Now you have customers competing for um, the few people that are still left in the market. Well, that pushes the price up again. Um, and eventually you find a, a happy medium and you get what would be called, I guess, a market price for that service. Um. Let's see. Well, I've been talking for like 25 minutes here. Uh, this is like an awkward place to end, but um, I think that we'll probably call it there. Uh, I, I hope that there's been some kind of a... Um, I hope you've gotten something out of this, um, that you understand where prices come from a little bit better. I, I mean, I think that there's this idea out there that prices are just announced or declared, uh, but they're, you know, prices are a result of uh, market competition. And that market competition is not between just the producers that produce the same kinds of products. Um, it's also between the consumer and the producer, uh, where the consumer's trying to pay as little for as much as they can, the producer's trying to get as much for as little as they can, and you find some number in the middle where everybody gets what they want. And, you know, that's where we are. And the labor market works the same way. Uh, employees are out there trying to get as much money for as little work, and employers are out there trying to get as much work for as little money, and somewhere in the middle you find an agreement where um, the the employer gets the amount of work at, at a money that, at a the amount of work they want at an amount of money that they're willing to pay, and the employee gets the amount of money that they want at an amount of work that they're willing to do. And there you are, market price. Unless, of course, you throw in government interference with minimum wage laws, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that's a topic for another time. And uh, with that, um, I hope that you, uh, as usual, uh, follow us on Facebook, subscribe on iTunes and Podbean, um, like and share. Uh, I hope you're, <laughs> I hope you're enjoying these uh, solo episodes. Um, but we'll be back to normal soon enough, and uh, we got some ideas in to to get um, to get Gary involved, uh, even if we can't meet in person. Um, so. Uh, I'm not sure when I'll be back. Uh, I guess it'll be when I have something more to talk about or when we can finally get together and, and do something. Um, and I'll, I'll keep trying my, uh, trying my luck with the news to see if I can make it through it without, um, you know, finding myself obsessively checking my temperature and, um, you know, feeling sick in my head. <laughs> uh, so whenever that is that I'm back here, I, I hope you'll join us. Um, when, uh, I've, Finally get this right. And in the meantime, uh, try and stay free. Ciao. Mm -hmm.